So as you get your coffee this morning, if you could start thinking of this question, I, I, take your time, I'm okay with this. What I want you to think about this morning is how much you, as an individual, trust God in all the things that you face currently. And the second thing is, I want you to consider how you can trust God more. Because if I took a poll, which I did on Friday night, and I don't want to do that to us this morning, but if you take a poll of your own self, if you, you, you just take a moment to say, do I trust God 75% of the time or more? Do I trust Him 50% of the time? How about 25%? And when you start looking at what it means to trust God in all situations, some of us might have to, we're not Catholic, but we could go to a confession. We could go to a confessional mode if we wanted to. But I want to look today at the tenacity, I'll define the word in case you're unfamiliar with it, but the tenacity to trust God, because it takes some tenacity to trust God in our situations. But first I want you to see this small video. Jesus, I just don't trust you. You don't trust me? No, I mean, I want to trust you, I just don't. <laughs> I have an exercise that I think will really help. Oh, okay. Stand here and face this direction. <laughs> now, do you trust me? Uh, no, I just said I don't trust you. This is not part of the exercise. Oh, All right. Totally. Whenever I ask you if you trust me, you say, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Even though I don't. It's practice. Okay. So, do you trust me? Uh, yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. Are you going to catch me? Don't worry about it. Okay, that's the part I'm worried about. <laughs> you can do this, okay? Just trust me. Trust you. Fall back. Okay, well, Jesus, I trust you. Okay. Woo! Uh, okay. Uh, let's try this again. Face this direction and keep your feet planted, all right? Do you trust me? Yes, Jesus, I trust you. Now, fall back. David 
Absalom came in and killed him. He was mad, like that's not right. And so he kills him. And then he goes on the run for three years. And King David's upset. He really does want his son Absalom there with him. And in the process, he sends someone out to, his son gets back to Jerusalem. Let's just put it that way. And we're, I'm going to read starting in 2 Samuel 15. It won't be on your screen. Starting in verse 1. In the course of time, Absalom provided himself with a chariot. Now this is after he's back in Jerusalem. And horses and with 50 men to run ahead of him. He would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. Whenever anyone came with a complaint to place before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out to him, what town are you from? He would answer, your servant is from one of the tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, look, your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me, and I would see that they receive justice. So his own son, David's own son, is coming against him. And he's saying, well, the king really doesn't care. He hasn't provided provision for you, for someone to hear justly what's going on. And so he's buttering them up for something. Absalom, his own son. And so on the screen, 2 Samuel 15, starting in verse 5, the Bible continues. Also, whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Verse 6, Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. So he stole the hearts of the people of Israel. And he didn't just do this for a week and come against his dad for a week. He did it for four years, the Bible says. Four years of building up secretly people who aren't trusting the king anymore. It's a little bit dysfunctional. He lies to his dad. And after four years of doing this, he says, I have to go down to Hebron. I made this commitment. I made this vow before God. And I said that if you would accept me back in Jerusalem, I would go get my worship on down in Hebron. And Hebron's like New Smyrna from here, 19 miles-ish. You know? So he just said, I'm going to go to the next city and do what I said I would do before God. And technically... As soon as he leaves, this is what happens in 2 Samuel 15, verse 10. Then Absalom sent secret messengers. And I'm going to stop there. Secret messengers aren't good things. Like if I have secret messengers in my work, that's a gossip. That's, some, that's something bad's going on. If you have secret messengers, there's something about to go down. And so no one wants secret messengers. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout the tribes of Israel to say, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpets, then say, Absalom is king of heaven. 200 men from Jerusalem had accompanied Absalom. They had been invited as guests and went quite innocently, knowing nothing about the matter. And so I want to point this out. Sometimes when you have someone against you, they'll bring some innocent people along with them and maybe speak poorly against you. So I wanted to pause right now and talk about Trusting God. Let's make this a little interactive. You know, trusting God to keep his promises might be okay. It might be easy for you. It might be hard for you. But what is it that people do? Just call out some things that people do that lose your trust. And I don't mean, you don't have to say the name or exactly what someone did to you. That, that's not good. But what are some things that people can do to you to make you feel like you don't trust them anymore? Uh, gossip. Gossip. Why? Cheat. Steal. Steal. Keep them out of the know. Yeah, keep them out of the know. Have some secret things going on behind their back. Yeah. I don't like that. I never like it when my 10 year old daughter's whispering behind my back. I never know what that means. Like, it makes me nervous. Because a lot of times there's a practical joke involved. I wear, I wear leg braces. You'll feel comfortable with me. But I wear leg, I wear leg braces at one time. I had played a practical joke on her on April Fool, Fool's Day. And the next day, I woke up. And I, I wore leg braces to get around. And I could not find the leg braces. They were put up. But she loved them. But so anyway, <laughs> secret things. I, I don't trust her. Yeah, that's right. Sermon's over. I don't trust my daughter. 
So, continuing on in verse 13, a messenger, not a secret messenger this time, but a messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with Absalom. He gave him the warning. Someone gave him the heads up. There's some people against you. They're for your son. Then David said to all his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee, or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately, or he will move quickly to overtake us and bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. I, I wondered this when I read it, like, why the guy, this is King David, right? This is the guy who slayed the giant. This is the guy who won some battles. He's a warrior. And he's like, we need to flee. And I thought, why does he need to flee? And I'll tell you why he needs to flee. Because he was trusting God. And he was sensitive to hearing God. And maybe you haven't read 2 Samuel. I, I hear that rumblings around here that we might start some sermon series on 1 and 2 Samuel in there. So that's coming up. There's some awesome practical life lessons in there that we can all learn from. But I wonder why David flee when I first read that. And here's in 1 Samuel, excuse me, 2 Samuel chapter 7. David has a covenant with God. God said to David, you will be blessed. Your house will be blessed. You, you'll be on the throne. Your line will be on the throne forever. So that he knows he has some promises from God. And so I ask you this morning, what promises are you resting on of God's? And if you're saying, oh, I don't know, maybe he can save me. Like when I die, my sins will be taken care of because I've trusted his son. Maybe that's the promise that you hang on this morning. But there are other promises about how we should live and how he rewards and how he interacts with us. And David himself knew this. So this is where we find him when he writes Psalm 62. He is being chased by his son out of his city where his tower is and into a cave, probably like this one that can be on the screen, this cave right here. Um, in, actually in 2 Samuel 17, when they're surmising, when they're guessing where David would be, he would be in a cave like this, a rock cave, you know, something solid. So if you read in 1 and 2 Samuel, there's some fortresses, some solid ground that you can get to. And we're going to find in Psalm 62 that God is the solid ground. God is the rock. For David, God is the rock. And this morning, God should be our rock. But let's go to Psalm 62, verse 1. My soul waits in silence for God only. From Him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. My stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. So if you listen to Christian radio, building 429, we won't be shaken. I'm giving you the background. This is your theme song for the day. If you haven't looked at it, you can Google it up later. So. My soul waits in silence for God. And I, I've, I've thought about this, and he, didn't, he wasn't waiting. Waiting was what his soul was doing. What he was doing was fleeing. He was getting into safer ground. And I th thought about this, and why in the world was he fleeing? I said I had to answer that one. But experience is the master teacher of trust. If you think about this, what do you, what do you trust? And I'm not asking you to tell me that. But if I trust a bottle or a magical pill to ease my pain, then that's what I'm going to turn to. My experience says... That's who I can trust. That's what I should trust. I should trust. And I'm not judging what you're doing. I'm, I'm just explaining to you. There's some differences. What you trust, you'll go to. You know? The, if you trust gossip to make you feel better about yourself and bring other people down, that's what you'll go to. If you trust worry, what? I trust worry? Yeah, if you worry, and that's your go-to, that's, that's what you'll end up, your experience will tell you that's what you should do. But this morning, we need to learn what David learned, and that is you can wait for the only source of your comfort, rest, salvation, security, no matter what you face. You can wait on it, but still be in action. And catch this. Sometimes you need to keep moving. 
when you're trusting God, you don't just say, well, I'm going to wait here. I'm not, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to move forward. I'm just going to trust God. Just trust Him. Yeah, you can. That's cool. But move. Take the next action He needs you to take. If it's flee, flee. And I, I think about what's coming against David, and we're going to read that next. It's people trying to murder him. People trying to bring him down. Literally bring him down from his high position. Now, when you go to work, I hope someone's not trying to murder you. If not, if so, I think you might want to, I'll help you with your resume or something. But you really should move to another place. You know, sometimes we naturally know if someone's coming against me. If, if you say something against my wife, and it's not joking, you know, my natural instinct is to say, what? You know, like, we're going to, huh? I'm going to say something back. We're going to go at this. But maybe I should wait in silence and be comforted in my soul and wait for God. Maybe I should walk away from the challenge at that moment like King David did. So David makes God his rock. He says, he is my salvation. He is my rock. He is my stronghold. If you pull up the Tower of David, this is what he's thinking of. You know, when we're solid as a rock, when we're in God, we, he says here, I shall not be greatly shaken. In verse 2, I shall not be greatly shaken. Greatly shaken to me means there might be some shaking going on at first. Like you can rile me up, you can upset me. But at the end, I'm not going to be greatly shaken because I'm in a fortress. God is my fortress. But as we move on, You'll notice. Well, let's just move on. Let's just go to verse 3. How long will you assail me, a man? Assail a man. And the NIV it says, how long will you assault me? How long are you going to come at me, people? That you may murder him, all of you, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence. See, this is a poem. This is a song about God. And he compares the stronghold of God, the tower of God, God is my strong tower, to what men do and what men are. You know, if we have some untrustworthy people around us, they're like a, a fence about ready to come down on us and kill us. You can bring up a fence. Verse 4, they have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delight in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. Exactly what Absalom was doing. Bowing before the king, may I go praise God in Hebron. And in the meantime, he's bringing up a, a, an insurrection, a, a battle against his own father. And I think about this in my own life. I've dealt with some tottering fences. I've, I've dealt with some leaning walls. I've dealt with some people that aren't trustworthy. People that are a little shaky. And they can be shaken, and they're trying to shake me. And they're unstable in what they do. The best illustration I can think of, back in the day, I, I wear leg braces, and uh, well, I already told you that, but I was a practitioner. I, I designed braces and artificial limbs. That's what I originally went to school for. And get to know Corey for 30 seconds. But one of my jobs, I, I left a guy in business, and this other company said, hey, we'll start you your own practice. Okay. You know, I'm a young guy I'm in my 20s. You okay? So, two years, you don't have to produce anything, like money. You don't have to produce profit for two years. We're behind you, okay? So, I never checked with how good their lab was because they wanted to hire me as a lab type person. And I'm like, no, I'm a practitioner. So I never checked that they got the real lab person in there. And so when braces came in, I went out and I had to put my reputation on the line. Put. The doctors trust in me. And if you've ever dealt with physicians, they're not, they're not going to just refer you to anybody. They have to trust the person they refer you to. And so I, I built up trust with them. And the first brace that came was, when you use words like lumpy, bumpy, and flimsy for a leg brace, that's probably not going to cut it with the doctor. So, you know, I got this out of the box. I wouldn't put it on my dog. I wouldn't. And I shipped it back and I said, this isn't going to cut it. So I went up to have a meeting about this with the corporate office. And when I went to the corporate office, they said, we would be in so much trouble if they knew what we were doing. And I looked at the guy beside me and I said, what are we doing? And it took me a couple months to figure out what they were doing. They were actually double billing Medicare. 
they were fraudulently adding stuff to the braces I was putting on patients. And I was like, holy smokes, I need to get out of here. So I wrote up this big thing. And right before I left, this guy he used to work for, yeah, I'm calling him out this morning. Now, he used to work for Johnson & Johnson Durable Medical. So this guy knew a thing about sterile medical equipment and highfalutin resume, all this high position. He comes down and he says to me, you've messed up. Like, you couldn't produce down here. And I said, no, that's not it. He's like, well, that's the story. You're not doing this right. I'm like, well, what about the fact that you're overbuilding Medicare? And he's like, that's not going on. I said, well, okay. So I handed in my paperwork and I found myself another job and moved to Virginia and got out of here. But in the process, I was like a, the building that I was in was stable, but it felt like I was in a crumbling wall type of situation. A unstable, you lied to me, your trust was betrayed, and now it's my problem. And so you probably have some stories in your life of people who you thought, hey, they were pretty trustworthy, and they weren't. They delighted in their falsehood. And they blessed you, but behind your back they were saying some things that you didn't appreciate so much. But when we had the verbal assault against us, I love what David does next in verse 5 of Psalm 62. David reminds himself like this. The Bible says, my soul, wait in silence for God only. He kind of instructs himself. The first time he says, my soul waits for God. This time he's saying, I need to remind myself to wait on God. My hope is from him. And he repeats, he only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. And verse 7, on God my salvation and my glory rest, the rock of my strength, my refuge is in God. Trust him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Selah, by the way, in case you wonder, that's the name of a group. But beyond that, it's like a, the pause in the song. It's like the, let's, let's reflect here. So the first verse that we went through, God is the source of my comfort, my salvation. I can wait on him. And are you asking yourself, do I have that kind of trust? You're, you're probably saying, well, I never had to run and hide in a cave. No one was against me like that. But do you have the kind of trust that when people are coming against you, you, you can wait in silence for God to speak. You, your soul is comforted. And the next thing, did you actually move yourself into a position to receive God's blessing and his safety? Or have you moved yourself to the right position to trust God? Or are you staying where you're at hoping? And the other thing that I thought before we move on is when you wait on God, some of us think we're waiting on him to come to us. And I want to put this in perspective this morning. David's talking about the kind of salvation that's like, rescue me, come, come to me. God, deliver me from this situation. Be with me, God. But we, if we're believers, have the Holy Spirit in us. We don't have to wait on God to come across 2,372 miles from where he's at to come and save us, to come and comfort us, to come and rescue us. He's here with us this morning. If we allow him to be with us in our situations, in our responses to people, if we can trust him in all times, at all times, and pouring out our heart to him. <clears throat> are you good at that? Are you good at pouring out your hearts? And some of us are prayer warriors. We, we know how to bring it when it comes to bringing it to God. But when it comes to letting God see your whole person, everything about you, how are you at that? And I think of it, this analogy. Uh, the comedian Michael Jr., if you ever heard of him, he, he speaks of this when he's given his message of salvation of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, that kind of salvation. Not the rescue me, oh God, from this person that's going to murder me salvation. The type of salvation that we need for eternal glory, for eternal life, that kind of salvation. And he says something like this. We, we invite Jesus, and Jesus is at the door, and he stands and he knocks. And we say, come on in, but stand in the foyer because there's some dirty dishes in my kitchen. You know, there's some things in my kitchen that I haven't cleaned up yet. And God, please, don't look in my closet. I have some messes in there that I'm trying to keep back. I, I don't need you to see this right now. 
And so we invite him, but we don't pour out our whole hearts. We don't let him see our whole house. We just let him see the parts that look good, that, that we think we need to present before him. But I'm telling you this morning that David, King David understood. He was a guy who had some lust issues. He was a guy who murdered a guy himself. He had some problems, but he was still a guy after God's own heart. And he knew that he could trust God because God always came through on his promises. So it's one thing to admire David for his confidence and his security. We can stand back and say, well, he was, he had it. That's what I want to be. I want to be like David this morning. But it didn't come easy for him. He had to remind himself in the midway of the song, God, or not to God, but to himself. He hasn't even started his prayer to God. He's saying to himself, I need to remember to wait on God. Through all the situations he had been through, he still had to remind himself, I need to trust and wait on God. And so each new crisis that you face is a new chance to recommit to God. And we must remind ourselves, this is my another point in there, I must remind myself that in all situations, that I can put my trust in God. He's the source of my hope and my peace. If you have any other trust issues, like you say, my hope is that I have a million dollars. My hope is that I get out of this financial situation. My peace will come when I have $30,000 pay off these credit card bills. That's not what we're talking about this morning. That might be what you're talking about, but you haven't put your trust in God, you put your trust in money. Yeah. And I must say this, God talks a lot about money in the Bible, and if I had to stand up here and confess, and I will, it's okay. I have some issues. But I would say that financially, that's the last place in my life that I learned to trust God. That was the biggest stronghold against God. That I can trust him for a lot of other things, but that money thing, I really want that right now. I need that right now. How are you going to come up with that? So I, I've come to my own solutions. But each crisis, each time we face something, we need a new commitment, a recommitment to God. It's, it's trusting for more than good outcomes. Sometimes we say, we trust, well, God will get me through it. Yeah, but we trust him for the good outcome. Maybe what we should be trusting him for is just to speak clearly to us in the dark. I'm speaking to you, God. I'm pouring out to you as the song that we'll hear in a little bit. I'm, I'm crying out to you, God. I want to hear back from you. I want to hear from you. And maybe it's not the good outcome that I'm looking for. Maybe it's just your voice in the situation that I need. And we need to quit taking our assessment of the situation, of things that we can see, and change that into an assessment of God's character. And change the situation instead of worrying about, well, this looks pretty bad to me. Focus on the one who's got you. Focus the one that you are in and his strength and his power. But it takes tenacity. Tenacity is determination, like dogged determination, unchangingness. It's a determination to follow after God. It's not just a, I trust him. It's, it's I trust him, but here's what I need to do about that. I'm going to take the action. So I want you to see this video from one of my favorites. Movies. Pursuit of happiness. It would be a One day, a man was drowning in the water. The boat came by and said, You need any help? He said, No, thank you, God will send me. Then another boat came by and said, Do you need any help? And he said, No, thank you, God will send me. Then he jumped in and went to heaven. And he said, God, why didn't you save me? And God said, I sent you two big boats of me. <laughs> Do you like it? So this morning, sometimes, you know, we can hide out from people and we can say, God, help me from this situation, get me through it. But honestly, sometimes we need to pay attention to godly men and women that God's put in front of us that we can trust and they can mentor us and they can move us forward. And we need to put it into practice when we're having struggles God's trustworthy. And that's the thing, is God enough for you this morning? And that's where we mess up. We'll trust in a lot of things, but sometimes not God. I'll finish with this. Verse 9. Men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than breath. Let's stop right there. 
basically what it's saying is it doesn't matter what position you hold on earth, what you, who you say you are, who you think you are, if you were born into money, if you were born poor, if you're struggling through, when your opinion is a critical one against people, it holds no weight. It's like breath on the scales in comparison to what God's <coughs> judgment of the situation is and what God's character is about. In comparison, it's lighter than breath. Verse 10, do not trust in oppression and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Another warning about money. That's interesting. Uh, verse 11, once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. And when that happens, by the way, that was, that's like a Hebrew idiom. Not idiot, but idiom. A Hebrew idiom like, you're going to hear this again. It's like some of our sayings and speech. It just means this is an important point. Get it. That power belongs to God. And loving kindness is yours, O oh God. He finally goes to the prayer. Loving kindness is yours, O oh God, O oh Lord, for your recompense, of you recompense a man according to his work. Fancy words. I chose the NASB this morning because I love the fact that in the second verse, he says, I will not be greatly shaken. But once he reminds himself of what God is about, God's loving kindness, God's mercy, he himself realizes that I can't be shaken. I won't be shaken. It's not greatly shaken. It's I won't be shaken. He changes what he says. So the opinions and influence of people around us carry nothing in comparison to God's opinion. So if you're zoning out, if you're getting ready for the song, ready for your lunch, just focus in on me for a minute. And I want to give you this test this morning to find out if God's enough for you. If you're trusting God enough, there's a 10-question test that you're going to take. Yes. You don't have to raise your hand if it's yes, but count up your yeses. And by the way, this is the practical part where you say, how can I put this into play this week? How can I actually trust God more? So ask yourself these questions today. Number one, count up your yeses. When you're going through something difficult, do you pray about it? Okay, you, don't, you can do this or this. You don't have to, but you can just secretly go. When you're going through something difficult, do you pray about it? The second thing, when you experience a problem with other people, do you allow the Bible to guide you? Or do you are you on your my gut feeling here? You know, this is how I should treat that. Uh, number three, do you make it a point to read your Bible at least three to four times a week? Now I guarantee you, if you make it a point to study and read God's word, not the words on the front of the Bible that says Holy Bible. I'm talking about in like the words, and you study it three or four times a week, I guarantee you it won't stop at three or four times a week. I don't make too many guarantees, but I know God's Word with the Spirit of God working in us will have us to read it more. Number four, do you attend church regularly for spiritual growth and fellowship with other Christians? Now, if you attend just so that you can get the free donuts and coffee, that's not what that said right there. It said, do you attend regularly for spiritual growth and fellowship? And number five, do you find it easy to recognize God's blessings in your life? Are you too worried about the problems and the situations and the people coming against you and what you're going to react to them, that you're, you don't take time to count God's blessings. Number six, do you trust that God has your best interests at heart? Even when it seems like everything is falling apart or if he's taking away something from you that you cherish. Can you bring up the teddy bear picture for me? Sometimes, if we wait, we'll figure out the true blessing. There, there's something bigger. If we trust, and I want to, we're going to continue on this list, but I want to say this real quick. Have you ever read Hebrews chapter 11? The book of Hebrews? No. Chapter 11 talks about the, by faith, Noah built an ark. You know, by faith, this person did this, this person did that. Not that we're going to rewrite the Bible, but we need to write our own chapter. By faith, you know, when we trust God in the little things, our faith grows. And we have to have faith in God to trust Him. Sure. So which comes first, the chicken or the egg, the faith or the trust? I don't know, but move and do something this week and start trusting Him more. And I think your faith will grow. Number seven, do you trust God to always keep His promises? Now, I don't keep all my promises. I would love to say I do, but I've messed up on some promises over time. Another confession. That's like four, right? Four confessions. Um, do you trust God to always keep his promises? Number eight, are you willing to tell your friends and family about the things which you are trusting God with or struggling to trust God with? In other words, is trust in your conversations? Are you letting other people know, I trust God for this? 
or I'm struggling with this right now. I need help to trust God in this. Do you believe that God cares about the things that concern you? That's number nine. Do you actually care? Do you actually believe, excuse me, that God cares about the things that you're concerned with? And number ten, are you able to calm yourself down by thinking about how much Jesus has done for you? Any situation, are you able to calm yourself down when you think about the love that Christ has for you? Now, I'm, I want to pray this morning. And uh, if someone wants to come up and play some music, that's fine. If someone doesn't, that's fine too. But let's, let's close out in some prayer. We're going to open the table this morning. And I want you to, as you partake, I want you to think of your trusting of God. And our representation that we trust that you're going to return, God. We trust in you. We trust that you're our strong. So let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I don't want the faith that I just look in the Bible and say, I kind of want to be like that man. Lord, I want you to look on me and say, your, your faith will pour in. You trust me. Lord, we need you to remember this morning how much we can trust you. Lord, your, your character never changes. Lord, your promises never change. God, your perfect living word never changes. Lord, people come against us. People who we think are our friends and family actually can be against us, Lord. And it hurts. But Lord, we want you as a rock. Jesus, we want you as our stronghold. God, I want you to help me to be comforted by your spirit when things come against me. Lord, we pray this for ourselves this morning. Lord, I don't know what situations we're all facing. Lord, we don't want to be shaken. We need you, God. Lord, we just thank you for this morning. God, we love you. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for how you brought us through, God. Lord, help us to sit down this week and look at the areas that we don't trust you in and bring them forward. God, your mighty power is not done when it rose Jesus from the dead. Your mighty power lives in us, and your spirit is with us. Lord, we need it. We need it as a church, as we go out to this community and bring people in lovingly. Lord, people aren't going to be as excited as we are, and we know that. But Lord, that's where you come in, and your power comes in. And Lord, we can trust you that if we just go out and show love, and take up the move that you can be trusted with the rest. Lord, we just thank you for that this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So the table's open, the altar's open. Let's just continue to praise God.